go to our website and you'll find the link to register. We ask you to register, but we need a head count. Also, be aware that if you want to come, it's a long conference, but if you want to come on Friday morning, we only have 50 seats. It's a small room. We will not be able to sit more than 50 people on Friday morning. So uh, if you want to, to, be, to attend the whole conference, please register quickly and indicate you will be there on Friday morning. All right. Um, today, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker and my uh, still newish, new, newish colleague, uh, Laura uh, Matthews, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. She's been with us for a few months. A few months. A uh, she got a PhD from the University of Georgia in 2021, and the title of Illness, mental illness as inadaptivity and inactive approach. She works on a range of issues, philosophy of medicine, philosophy of psychiatry, and uh, also philosophy of cognitive science. Uh, and today she's going to be talking about delusions as connective, cognitive affective complexes. Thank you. Thank you uh, to everyone for being here. Um, thanks to the center for inviting me. Thanks to uh, Panera for finally showing up. <laughs> <laughs> My paper is called Delusions as Cognitive Effective Complexes. So I will start um, just by giving an overview of what I'm going to do today. So I'll present the DSM definition of delusion. And I just briefly note that there's some cultural relativity to this definition. Then I'm going to go into two critiques, um, one of which is fairly prominent in the literature and one of which is kind of motivated by my approach to these issues. And I'm going to use that to motivate my inactive approach to delusions. So I'll have to introduce some features of the inactive approach, um, sense making as autopoiesis plus adaptivity. Talk a little bit about modeling these processes using dynamical systems theory. And I'm going to do just a teeny tiny bit of phenomenology, but I know my audience, so I'll try to keep it. So from there, I can present uh, fixed beliefs as cognitive effective complexes, and I'm going to use this concept of adaptivity to answer the demarcation question. So that's a question of what makes a fixed belief a delusion as opposed to a more ordinary kind of fixed belief. Okay, so here's the definition. It's a little lengthy, so my apologies about that. It says, Delusions are fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. Their content may include a variety of themes, for example, persecutory, referential, somatic, religious, grandiose. Delusions are deemed bizarre if they are clearly implausible and not understandable to same culture peers and do not derive from ordinary life experiences. Those are my emphasis. An example of a bizarre delusion is the belief that an outside force has removed his or her internal organs and replaced them with someone else's organs without leaving any wounds or scars. An example of a non-bizarre delusion is the belief that one is under surveillance by the police despite a lack of convincing evidence. The distinction between a delusion and a strongly held idea is sometimes difficult to make and depends in part on the degree of conviction with which the belief is held despite clear or reasonable contradictory evidence regarding its veracity. Okay, so just briefly note that bizarreness is defined here in terms of um, some relation to culture. So a belief about delusion is bizarre, it's not understandable to say the culture appears. Um, this, this suggests that we might need some way of thinking about delusions that is incorporating that social or cultural context, and I suggest that the inactive approach can do that. So that's one motivation for my idea. Okay, but the definition invites one fairly obvious criticism. Delusions are fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. That may seem to be fairly ordinary phenomena, right? Many people are going to have beliefs of this nature. Uh, this is a criticism that's been advanced fairly regularly in the literature. You can think of religious or New Age beliefs in this regard, regular forms of self-deceptions or biases. So an example of this might be something like the self-serving bias. This is the tendency that we have to attribute mistakes that we make to external sources and to attribute good things that happen to us uh, based on internal things. Um, there's a hypothesis known as depressive realism, which suggests that people who are depressed who don't have this self-serving bias, so they're actually being more accurate about their self-image than other people are. Um, and so that suggests that something like this bias is actually a healthy feature of touch. 
Um, I'll give a couple other examples because I'm going to return to these at the end of the paper. Um, and you might notice some of my just personal vendettas emerging. And some of this criticism here. So, for example, 24% of Americans, according to this Gallup poll, are convinced that the Bible is the literal word of God. 18% of Americans believe that humans have always existed in their present form. 29% of Americans believe in astrology. And that number seems to be on the rise despite my best efforts, keeps going on. <laughs> okay, so some responses to this problem have focused on purely epistemic features of delusions. So some people might want to suggest that what makes delusions uh, pathological as opposed to just ordinary false beliefs is that they involve particular kinds of epistemic failures. So these are called rationalist views. Other approaches are gonna say that what makes delusions pathological has to do with some kind of content of the experience. The experience itself is somewhat bizarre. So the conclusions that people arrive at as a result of that experience are somewhat rational. It's just that the experience itself is disordered. So my suggestion to, to answer this demarcation question is that fixed beliefs are pathological when they hinder adaptive agency. So there have been some other approaches that make similar kinds of claims there. Um, and that can be a way of kind of integrating both the epistemic and the um, empiricist kind of views. It's not really kind of um, combating either of those positions. Okay, secondly, um, might think that uh, taking this kind of purely epistemic approach to define delusions obfuscates some of the emotional content that would be at play in these uh, kinds of beliefs. So pers persecutory delusion is the most common type of delusion that somebody might have. It's defined as the belief that one is going to be harmed, harassed, and so forth by an individual organization or other group. Um, so this tends to be described as though the content of the judgment that one is being surveilled can really be kind of extricated from the emotional response that one might have towards the world if, if one adopts that kind of belief. So my suggestion is that it's going to be maybe a little bit more enlightening to think of the emotional content as, as kind of being connected to the judgment um, about being surveilled. So if I, if I judge that I'm being surveilled, in other words, I'm generally not going to maintain this as a dispassionate belief. I'm going to be pretty anxious about this. It's going to be fearful, and that's going to kind of permeate my experience. And what I will argue is that it can kind of make sense of why the belief is particularly resistant to counter evidence is that the emotional content is kind of bolstering the judgment. When we take a broader approach there, if it's the case that delusions have effective and cognitive content, then um, some similarities across diagnostic categories emerge here. So we can see some connections to delusional experience in mood disorders and bipolar disorder as well. Um, and so if, if it's the case that our current diagnostic categories don't pick out natural kinds, which is a fairly widely accepted view at this point, um, maybe we want to be focusing more on symptoms and a view which kind of draws these connections can be helpful in that regard. So we can think about how these two things would be related in two specific types of delusions. So affected and persecutory delusions um, is sort of linked to this persistent fear and, and anxiety. The world is disclosed as being threatening. And then my judgments are that particular objects in the world are doing the threatening. Um, by contrast, something like a delusion of grandeur is the idea that you are somehow very powerful or capable of, of something extraordinary. So we can think of this as sort of a more expansive sort of mood, a sense of mastery or control over the environment. Um, and that sort of discloses particular opportunities in the environment as being particularly um, open to some. Okay, so then we can see how this might be present. These kinds of complexes might be present in other sorts of diagnostic categories. So this is a description of delusions that might be present in either major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. Uh, it's about um, how a sense of guilt can reach kind of delusionary levels. So it says, the sense of worthlessness or guilt associated with a major depressive episode may include unrealistic negative evaluations of one's worth or guilty preoccupations or ruminations over past failings. 
Such individuals often misinterpret neutral or trivial day-to-day -day events as evidence of personal defects and have an exaggerated sense of responsibility for untoward events. The sense of worthlessness or guilt may be of delusional proportions. For example, an individual who is convinced that he or she is personally responsible for world poverty. So we can see here again, sort of the links between the delusional experience and the delusional judgment. The subject is plagued by guilt in the sense that she feels guilty, but it's also kind of connected to evaluative judgments about the self that I am particularly worthless or um, potentially responsible for these kinds of events. Okay, um, and so then maybe something somewhat similar could be said to be going on in something like a specific phobia. So um, this is described as fear or anxiety that is out of proportion to the actual danger that the object or situation poses or more intense than is deemed necessary. Although individuals with specific phobia often recognize their reactions as disproportionate, they tend to overestimate the danger in their period situations. So this could be understood as a kind of cognitive affective complex. Um, affect is maybe more of the dominant feature in this sort of thing, but there's something like a judgment going on, which is resistant to counter evidence. The judgment, for example, that flying is extremely scary, that I shouldn't get on this plane. I'm overestimating the danger, even though I recognize the evidence that flying is actually much safer than driving a car, for example. Okay. So at this point, um, suggesting that we want a concept of delusions that needs to do the following things, needs to demarcate between pathological and non-pathological fixed beliefs. Um, it should attempt to integrate non-dosset non elements such as um, affect, and it should include reference to cultural context. So that's what motivates me to take this an active approach. So I'll say a little bit about this view. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar people are with this. Um, it's a view which started roughly with the publication of this book, Autopoiesis and Cognition, in 1980, and has been kind of developed further since then in these subsequent texts, The Embodied Mind, Mind and Life, and Sensory Motor Life, among others. It's now a very popular approach to um, issues in philosophy of psychiatry in particular especially due to its capacity to integrate different levels of explanation, biological, psychological, phenomenological, social sorts of uh, perspectives on mental illness. So this is a view which says that cognition is effective. These are sort of the three features that I'm gonna highlight. Sickness and health can then be depicted in terms of adaptivity. We use a dynamical systems theory to model relevant features of living systems, including uh, neurological systems. And we use an approach called neurophenomenology, which attempts to integrate phenomenology into some explanations from cognitive science. Okay, so a lot of this comes from um, Evan Thompson's book, Mind and Life, where the claim there is that living systems are cognitive systems. So as he puts it, the formal or organizational features distinctive of mind are an enriched version of those fundamental to life. So he has in mind here processes distinctive of life, things like self-differentiation, self-organization, and self-maintenance. These are fundamental features of living organisms, but they also undergird cognitive engagement with the world. Uh, they do that in part by instantiating a perspective, an embodied perspective on the world, um, and also a, a system of values against which an organism judge, judges interactions as being good or bad for it. So it's an embodied approach. Um, it, it describes uh, sense making as skillful know-how. So cognition is sort of this active engagement with the world. Getting slightly more specific here, there's two features of cognitive systems that are important to highlight. <laughs> um, cognitive systems are autopoetic systems, which is to say that they are systems that produce their own selves and maintain themselves against degradation. So autopoiesis refers to this biochemical, self-producing and non-linear sort of dynamical process of differentiating and maintaining oneself against environmental degradations. 
So Thompson specifies these three conditions that are necessary for a system to be autopoetic. Um, it's an autonomous system whose constituent processes recursively depend on each other for their generation and their realization as a network, constitute the system as a unity in whatever domain they exist, and, de and determine a domain of possible interactions with the environment. So standardly, this is described from the perspective of, of a single cell, just to get the most basic presentation of what this looks like. The idea is that the cell, through its own processes, is differentiating itself from the environment. Uh, it constructs the semi-permeable membrane, and the membrane sort of takes part in determining which kinds of interactions the cell will engage in. It um, specifies which kind of features are going to pass over the membrane, become part of that internal network of, of reactions, where the internal network of reactions is essentially what the cell is, this process of cell production of maintaining the membrane and the internal network of processes. So the reason that this is important is because autopoiesis is a way of understanding a basic naturalization of norms in an organism. It sets up this norm of survival. Those interactions that the cell engages in that maintain autopoiesis are good. Those are what they are, that's what's sought after. And um, those that threaten autopoiesis are, are bad and they're avoided. Okay, so this process is then, um, adaptivity is understood as in addition to autopoietic processes. So adaptivity is the organism's capacity for self-monitoring and self-regulating. And this is what allows the organism to generate not just the bivalent norm of autopoiesis, this conserves autopoiesis or this doesn't, but a more um, varied system of norms that regulate its engagement with the environment. Um, so one way of understanding this is that there are many things that an organism can do that will technically conserve autopoiesis, but would all things considered be bad? So for example, it might be, um, I could eat McDonald's every day, that would conserve autopoiesis. But generally speaking, I should not do that. It's suboptimal in the sense that it's going to ultimately decrease my capacity to maintain myself in the future. So it's gonna do things like increase my cholesterol, increase my blood pressure and so forth. Um, if we think about this just in terms of autopoiesis, those sorts of things get left out of the picture. So the concept of adaptivity is postulated by DiPaolo in his 2005 paper as a way to understand sickness and health. So why is it that high blood, high blood pressure is bad? It's not because it doesn't conserve autopoiesis. It's because it um, tends to decrease my capacity to preserve autopoiesis in the future. So um, my work has focused on sort of using this concept of adaptivity to develop a concept of mental health and illness, which involves um, scaling things up to the human scale. We're not talking about single cells, obviously. We're talking about human beings in their sociocultural environments. But the processes are essentially the same. I generate norms which regulate my interactions with the environment. I can be said to be doing well when I'm living in accordance with those norms and maintain myself within an ideal range of states. And I can be said to be doing poorly when I'm sort of moving out of that range of states and leading to um, decreased capacity to maintain myself. Um, so I'm gonna maybe just shamelessly underdevelop this part of the talk, but and activists have done lots of things to scale up to the human level. So this involves talking about sensory motor consciousness. Um, Alvin Noe from uh, Berkeley talks about sensory motor dependencies. Um, there's also been a lot of work to, about sensory motor habits as ways of regulating my interactions with the environment. Um, from an intersubjective standpoint, we can think about social interactions and how they um, have sort of downward effects on my own cognition as a result of that interaction. Uh, and there's also been work on sort of taking something like the extended mind thesis and extending it to social institutions as a way of thinking about how social institutions can sort of foster my own sense making. Um, and so a, a key takeaway of these um, ways of scaling up the approach is that at each level of organization, there's sort of a new form of autonomy that emerges. 
So say, for example, in an in a interpersonal interaction, there can be circumstances in which it sort of takes on a life of its own and influences my behavior. Um, the autonomy may be temporary and then it dissipates, uh, but it does have some kind of downward effects as they claim. Okay. So um, thinking about how mental health and mental illness can be conceived in these terms, it's different kinds of approaches that have been used. Um, so Michelle Mace says that mental illness involves some kind of destabilization of regional identities, which are themselves comprised of bundles of habits. So what she has in mind here is that there's gonna be a group of habits that I have that allow me to maintain my identity as an academic, for example. And then there's gonna be a separate group of habits that I use in order to maintain my identity as a swimmer or whatever it is. Um, and so when I become mentally ill, um, something happens that causes these regional identities to destabilize. I'm not able to maintain those identities in the face of that kind of disruption. Uh, Nielsen talks about mental disorder in terms of violations of functional norms of sense making. This is a little bit closer to my view of the idea that there are norms that arise at a personal level in the context of a social environment. <laughs> And mental disorder involves the violation of those functional norms. My approach is to think of these as disruptions to interactive adaptivity. So this is just the realm of interactive behavior within a social environment. Um, disruptions to self-monitoring and self-regulating within that kind of environment that lead me to be unable to pursue my goals, my self-generated goals. Okay, so this is all developed in, in other work. So that's why I'm kind of moving through it a little bit more quickly. So that we can get to um, this idea of delusions as cognitive effective complexes. So um, the next aspect of the inactive approach that I want to highlight so that I can employ it in my view is this um, dynamical systems theory approach to modeling the dynamics that are going on. So um, DST can be used to model the self-organizing dynamics of autopoetic processes but also self-organizing dynamics of neural systems. And it's more speculative uses. It's been used to model um, higher level cognition and behavior. And I'll give some examples of what that looks like. So DSD involves qualitatively studying complex nonlinear dynamical systems with the aim of identifying global patterns. Because the systems that it's studying are complex and nonlinear, these global patterns are often unexpected or they're unpredictable based solely on the activity of the system's parts. So that's why these complex um, dynamical equations are used to model these sorts of uh, dynamics. Uh, so there's a neuroscientist named Johan John who works at Boston University. He talks about how to use these tools to model higher level cognition and also how to um, use them to talk about symptoms of mental disorder. So he describes it like this. He says, dynamical systems theory is a body of tools for thinking about time varying phenomena using a blend of calculus and geometry, enabling an intuitive visual perspective. So in neuroscience, this has been used for um, data fitting. So if you have neuroimaging from fMRI or something like that, you can use dynamical systems theory to try to make sense of the data that you receive. It's also been used to understand the behavior of particular neurons. Um, so using DST as a way of under, understanding, for example, under what circumstances particular neurons will fire. Uh, the speculative applications are, to me, the more interesting ones, and they're used to model some higher level behavior. So we'll see in a minute what that looks like. Okay, so key concepts to, to have in mind. The phase space is an abstract geometrical depiction of all of the system's possible states throughout time, given its starting condition. Attractors in phase space are those that the system is more likely to be found in, states that the system will tend towards over time. So given enough time, it's going to return to one of those attractor states. 
These are depicted by valleys and phase states. So the deeper the valley, valley the more stable the be this um, state is. And I'll give a picture that might help. Uh, repellers are just the opposite. So they're unstable states of the system. Any small perturbation is gonna push the system out of that state. And these are depicted by peaks. So here's an example of what this looks like. State two is a stable state of the system. It's depicted by this valley. State three is an even more stable state of the system depicted by an even deeper valley. State one would be an unstable state of the system, something that requires lots of energy to get into and something that could be sort of shaken out of very easily. Okay, so how is this used to model some higher level behavior? Um, attractors and repellers can be used, John suggests, to understand behavioral and emotional states and symptoms of psychiatric disorders. So something like hunger could be understood as a stable attractor. Um, meaning that, you know, you get hungry, you eat some food, you have your Panera bagel or whatever it is. Um, and then given enough time, the system is going to return to that stable attractor state. So it's something that sort of, um, it tends towards over time. In the context of psychiatric conditions, John has suggested that something like obsessive thoughts can be understood as a stable attractor state. So for example, if you're somebody who ruminates and you constantly think about, you know, things that you said or did over the day, um, your mind tends toward that state. Somebody might try to distract you and say, well, don't think about that. Think about this. Here's something to cheer you up. And that might work for a little while, but then you're going to steadily return to that state over time. So stable attractors can be understood in terms of patterns or can be a way to understand patterns of thinking in these psychiatric disorders. Uh, a, a slightly different example here would be something like ADHD, um, where you know it's very easy to push somebody out of the state of sustained attention. So that might be understood as maybe a very narrow attractor state for that person, but they, they could be easily perturbed from. So there are some other suggestions about how to use this kind of theory to understand the development of conceptual knowledge over time, where the idea is that the phase space develops these attractors and peaks based off of past experience. Um, uh, Smith and Thalen have talked about this with respect to development, development of cognition over time. Um, as an infant is, is developing, they might not have very many perceptual expectations based off of past experience. But as the system um, is kind of fed information from its environment over time, those perceptual expectations form and they're described in terms of these attractors in phase space. So they suggest that something like abstract knowledge can be um, modeled in this way Abstract knowledge is going to be concepts that apply across a wide variety of contexts. So um, an example might be, you know, this is solid, or this is a thing that I can't walk through, or something like that. Um, it's abstract in the sense, not that it's completely removed from a particular context, but that it is um, informing lots of different contexts. It's going to be present across lots of different circumstances. So um, just kind of extending this, to understanding of the concepts that we need in order to get these cognitive effective complexes. We can understand um, emotional states that a system might tend to be in as these deep stable attractor states and um, abstract beliefs. Again, in terms of these deep stable attractor states, the deeper a state uh, that's associated with an abstract belief, the more conviction this person has in this belief. The more universal it is, the more it applies across multiple different contexts. So a couple examples of what I'm thinking of here, something like a devout Christian's unwavering faith in God is something that um, is very difficult to shake them out of. So that's how it would be understood as this deep, stable, attractor state, something that applies across lots of different contexts. So for example, we, we talk about the Christian seeing God's hand in everything or all different kinds of events interpreted in light of this kind of belief. 
Um, and it uh, sort of structures their experience in that way. We can compare this to a different kind of circumstance. <clears throat> Consider a non-believer. They have no faith in God, but they find themselves in a situation where their loved one is battling cancer. This is a kind of extreme situation. We understand this uh, extreme perturbation to the system. And so now um, maybe they're up at that peak that would have described situations in which they believe in God. So this is enough of a kind of push to get them to that state. Uh, and in this circumstance, they might cry out to God, please, please save me. So a similar kind of um, structure can be understood for something like um, attractor states for effective habits. This is Mesa's term, where um, these are patterns, emotional patterns of response to the world, just as they're sort of belief patterns of response to the world. So then um, another aspect of this theory that's relevant here is the ways in which it models intermodel intermodular um, communication. So Smith and Thalen say um, communication between two different aspects of the brain or two different um, two different attractive states that correlate to um, features of cognitive space or something like that, they're in constant communication with each other as opposed to having the communication occur after. <laughs> Um, so here, so they suggest a simplified example to understand what they're talking about here. So they say, consider a simplified explanation of something like the perception of an object in space. So they say, imagine that there's a what system and a where system. They're going to be linked together, not based on some, some kind of sequential communication, but based off of sort of constant intermodular communication. So um, they say perception of an object involves three time-locked time locked and interlocking, interacting maps, one mapping the what map maps textures and edges from the visual input to levels of activity in a population of units. The second mapping the where map maps movement in the physical world to the activity level of the second group of units. The third mapping is the re-entrant map. It maps the activity levels of the what and where systems onto each other. Um, and just a little bit more clarification here that indicates that there's not these discrete processes or steps in processing, but they're sort of integrated fundamentally. So they write, the where system, for example, does not collect some kind of data, process it, and then output some finished product in quantum steps. Rather, each system is made up of a population of neurons, and the activity of the, whole, of the group as a whole is continuous. These systems are always active. They do not shut up, shut off. There is continuously and always a path of joint activity of the what and where systems being traced through the state space. Okay, so um, the idea is that there's this intermodular communication understood in terms of reentry, where reentrant processes are defined as those that involve one localized population of excitatory neurons simultaneously both stimulating and being stimulated by another such population. So my hypothesis is that we could understand the integration of affect and belief in a similar kind of way. Delusions as cognitive affective complexes would involve the attractor state that is associated with the emotional response to the world, the attractor state that's associated with the belief as being kind of mutually informing one another. So I think this does a couple of different things. First of all, it might explain why delusional beliefs are so particularly resistant to counter evidence. My um, emotional response to the world is telling me just as much as my judgment about what's going on is telling me that this is the case. Okay, loose, I'm missing a slide here, but another um, thing that it might do is kind of solve the debate that we started off talking about, debate between whether we should take a more empiricist perspective about delusions or a more rationalist perspective. These were also described as top-down or bottom-up approaches. It's a way of kind of talking about the integration of those two approaches that doesn't preference one or the other. Okay, so um, fixed beliefs are from this perspective, these stable cognitive affective complexes. 
One reason that these might tend to be inadaptive, might tend to cause problems for people, is that um, they are fixed across various contexts. So we need some kind of flexibility to respond to varying contexts differently. Um, otherwise, it's not really going to foster adaptive agency. But it does also explain why some fixed beliefs, nevertheless, are good for people. If I have a deep and unwavering belief in God, for example, that can bring me some kind of comfort and confidence across changing circumstances. Um, and so it makes sense if both of those fit up. Okay, so um, some brief phenomenological considerations. Um, so one way of understanding this from a phenomenological perspective is by drawing on Heidegger's concepts of moods and understanding or interpretation. So Heidegger writes, state of mind always has its understanding, understanding always has its mood. Where the idea is that these are, as he puts it, equiprimordial. So neither one has preference over the other, but they sort of mutually form and shape each other. From this perspective, moods are sort of more general ways of intuning to the environment. They are not really the way that psychologists talk about moods or the way that they talk about emotions. Um, they are sort of just generally atmospheric. They disclose the world more in its entirety rather than being um, sort of intentional structures of relating to particular objects. And there has been some work on um, these kinds of phenomenological accounts of delusion from people like Sass and Matthew Ratcliffe. Um, they emphasize things like delusional themes. So I think there's a couple of things that a phenomenological interpretation gives us that add to this kind of account. Um, one of these is just a better understanding of what this kind of experience is like. So if we take this more phenomenological approach where we understand the mood and its interpretation as they sort of um, mutually inform each other, we can make sense of some of these pretty bizarre experiences. Like I just read um, a philosopher talking about his own experience with a psychotic disorder. And he said that um, mirrors, he, he always felt like somebody was behind it, but watching him. Um, so sometimes these kinds of experiences can seem pretty bizarre or um, just very far removed from our everyday experience. But we do have an understanding of what it's like to be in this kind of pervasive anxious state and how you might interpret certain environmental features as being um, signs of threat under those kinds of circumstances that you might not otherwise do. So insofar as um, a deeper understanding of people's experiences can combat stigma, then that seems to be an important feature of that kind of approach. Okay, so um, putting this all together, delusions are these persisting, cognitive affective complexes, so their understandings with their moods, which disclose the world in certain regular kinds of ways. From this perspective, the content of the delusion is not exhausted by this propositional content, like these people are out to get me, or I judge that I'm being followed, or something like that. But instead, it's this combination of the mood, which discloses the world as threatening, equally with the perception or judgment of particular entities is doing the threat. Okay, so returning to the demarcation question. Um, on my approach, we demarcate between pathological and non-pathological cognitions based off of whether they are um, helping an agent achieve their self-determined goals or helping them live up to values that they have set for themselves. So um, fixed beliefs as cognitive affective complexes are uh, pathological whenever they prevent the subject from um, engaging with their world in this way. We can see how lots of normal uh, or you know common forms of delusion might prevent the subject from engaging with their world in that way. Um, if you have a persecutory delusion, you're not really like, going out to lots of parties and like hanging out with people and stuff like that, you're probably restricting yourself to a small range of activities, um, prevents flourishing in that way. And maybe more generally, delusions can be so idiosyncratic that they kind of prevent you from engaging with others because you're just kind of, so to speak, in your own world. Okay, so compare this to the examples that I started off with 
Um, if you believe that the Bible is the literal, literal word of God, um, if you believe that humans have always existed in their present form, or if you believe um, that, you know, your personality trait is depicted by the month that you were born in or something like this. These can all foster um, social connectedness. These are beliefs that other people share. And so I might be part of the group in that way. Um, they might provide me with a sense of certainty that's comforting and that guides my decision making. Um, and they can just sort of foster a sense of well being. So, some um, consequences of viewing things in this way. As I mentioned, there might be some kind of connection between delusions and psychotic disorders and delusions and other kinds of disorders, especially mood and bipolar disorders. Um, some suggestions for treatment, um, perhaps emotional regulation could be helpful. Treatments which increase neuroplasticity can sort of be modeled as decreasing the strength of those attractor states and sort of allowing people to maybe get out of those patterns of thinking. And more generally, a, a dynamic systems theory approach would look for certain kinds of perturbations that might be unexpected, um, but kind of are predicted by the mathematical equations, which can lead to bifurcations of the system, which means um, the emergence of new patterns of behavior. So um, I teased this in my abstract, so I'll say something about this. How do we deal with this QAnon case? Very fascinated with this. Um, it's difficult to measure um, how many people subscribe to the theory, but according to this one study, around 10% of Americans subscribe to this for you, that devil-worshipping cannibalistic pedophiles are somehow running the world. Generally, these are leftist politicians or they're, um, it's like Tom Hanks, people like that. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's a couple different ways to address this issue, although I'm, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as well. I think, you know, there's two things that kind of push us in opposite directions here. On the one hand, you do kind of have a sense of community with people who also share these types of beliefs. And so maybe that's a sense in which these beliefs can be adapted to you. It also, I think, helps people kind of deal with certain anxieties that they have about the world. And that's why some of these theories can be attractive. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, people do become estranged from their families. So if you're interested, there's a subreddit where people uh, commiserate about these experiences. And it's actually quite like upsetting. I mean, these, these people like just become divorced from their families. Um, so from that perspective, maybe it's viewed more as an inadaptive way of thinking or of, of behaving or thinking. But I think maybe this is, you know, perhaps this is a way of answering this question, um, that it would be more understood in terms of cultic structures or this process of brainwashing where somebody's cognition gets hijacked from an external source. And in that case, uh, maybe not pathological because uh, they're really being manipulated rather than it being sort of an endogenous disease process or something like that. Thank you. In the final best involved, we've got plenty of time to uh, for questions. So let's take a two minute break so you can refresh yourself and then uh, you can have a better question.